law that I think is in legislation or, or is, is uh, in the midst of being passed and probably will be passed in New Jersey because it's got bipartisan and the support of bipartisan support as well as the support of the governor. And this law is, uh, I'm not saying that the law, okay, and as again, I, I am actually think that uh, that that the, some of the, the groups and this, this law is basically aimed at um, closing down combat zone wrestling in Jersey All Pro Wrestling. It's got a lot of legal wording, um, and I, I am not necessarily. I, 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 I'm, I don't know if I'm opposed to shutting them down. That's a, that's. I think that they have the right to do it. Um, they have the right to be. I think that the government has the right to regulate those groups. But whatever regulation they do has to be consistent throughout the industry. If it's, you know, I mean, like I, the only stuff, and, I, and, and the only stuff of combat zone wrestling that I've ever seen is um, I saw some clips of it on a television show, which probably isn't fair. And I've seen the combat zone wrestlers uh, wrestle I, when they wrestle for Big Japan. I've seen a couple of the clips, and and to me, they're they're it's bad wrestling. You know, it's it's um, um, as far as you know, timing's bad. The guys aren't very well trained, if trained at all, that type of stuff. But because it's bad wrestling, they still should go under the same, uh, whatever, the same regulations as every other form of wrestling. Um, but anyway, let me I, I, let me read some more of this. Okay, the legislature finds and declares that because its, its principal purpose is to entertain without injuring or disabling one of the participants, professional wrestling should be excluded from this system of regulation. They're trying to explain why um, they're they're going to regulate boxing wrestling. Okay, so that means like amateur wrestling, extreme wrestling, which is combat zone and all this, kickboxing or combative sporting event. Um, they are they are being regulated by the athletic commission, whereas professional wrestling is not. Now, of course, obviously, the the um, principal purpose um, of of any pro wrestling that I'm aware of is to entertain without injuring or disabling. I mean, there's no attempt. Do you know of any? I don't even know of any sport where there's an attempt to injure or disable. I don't think so. Um, I mean, it's a byproduct that sometimes happens in, in, in like a combat sport like a karate or boxing or kickboxing or, or even in a, in a UFC type of event. Um, hey, hey, what am I saying? Even in professional wrestling, the fact that there's probably more serious injuries in professional wrestling these days than in any of the other ones I just mentioned except for maybe maybe football. Um, let's see. The legislature further finds and declares because its principal purpose is to entertain by having its participants intentionally cause bleeding or perform acts which reasonably could be expected to cause bleeding. Extreme wrestling should be distinguished from professional wrestling. The emphasis is on dangerous stunts that cause injury and bleeding makes extreme wrestling potentially harmful to its participants. Furthermore, the atmosphere of base violence and depravity that prevails at an extreme wrestling event has a del deleterious effect on children and young adults. Moreover, the liberal bloodletting that characterizes many extreme wrestling events constitutes a public health hazard, not only for the participants, but also for the spectators. Hmm. Um, um, ha, um, is, there, is there a health hazard to the spectators? Uh, I don't know. Um, I mean, you know, I mean, I've seen chairs the, get thrown and hit a spectator. No, 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 no it's the, it says the liberal bloodletting. For the blood, I, don't, I mean, the blood, I mean there's, there's, no one's there's ever even been, uh, you know, never wrestler that has bled in a match with another wrestler has ever got him. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I certainly am not, never, I'm, there's certainly no medical cases of guys in double juice matches having HIV, and God knows that in the 80s we used to hear it was going to happen all the time, and it never and it never did, mm -hmm. as far as we know. As far as we know, it never did. And, I mean, anyway. if, it's not, if it doesn't affect the guy you're in the ring with that you're bleeding with, I don't see how it would affect the fans. Yeah. So anyway, for all of these reasons, extreme wrestling should be subject to strict state regulations. Because of the creativity of those who seek to profit from vul because the creativity of those who seek from to profit from vulgarity cannot be underestimated. Now, now, I love that line <laughs> because there's so much truth to that. Okay, but I mean, I, I think that at various times that hits WWF, WCW, and ECW at various times. Probably is strong, if not stronger, than any other than any of these groups. That's strong. I mean, maybe not stronger. But anyway, uh, the state athletic control board should be given a proper amount of latitude to regulate the attendant excesses of extreme wrestling that presently exist and could be incorporated into extreme wrestling events in the future. Do you know the thing is, is that like, how does ECW? I mean, you know, WCW right now is like um, a lot of skits, and I think I think when they do live shows, it's a lot of it's it's a lot of wrestling. WWF they do blood, but it's not they don't do blood that much on house shows, but they do blood on TV, you know, fairly regularly now. 
And um, but ECW does like you know the objects, and they all do the objects in hardcore matches anyway. And you know, ah. maybe the point is excessively. But I, I guess you'd know. have to define what excessively is. Every match on every show, every show, once a uh, month. Yeah. Okay. But once it's done, it's done. I mean, if it's one match a show, and that one match is that one match is just like you know a hardcore brawl where you go all over the place and you you know hit people as hard as you chairs. I mean, then it should be regulated. I'm just thinking it all needs to be regulated together. All I can say goes the board shall promulgate rules that differentiate an extreme wrestling an extreme wrestler from a professional wrestler. Okay, this is the difference. An extreme wrestling at an extreme wrestling event from a professional wrestling event. If a person is unsure whether he or she is an extreme wrestler, or if a promoter is unsure whether the event being promoted is an extreme wrestling event, it shall be the obligation of the person and the promoter, as appropriate, to consult the board for a ruling. That's scary. All right, this is this is the big one. An extreme wrestling wrestler or promoter of an extreme wrestling event who fails to apply for the required approval permits and licenses. Or a promoter of an extreme wrestling event who knowingly admits a person under the age of 18 to an extreme professional wrestling event shall be subject to a civil penalty of not less than five thousand dollars. Wow. Yeah. So, wow. so. So. Um, so no kids under 18. No kids under 18. Okay, we got uh, Tom on the line. Um, we'll, we'll get to Tom and just I just want to read more of this this stuff. Um, and we'll get Tom Zink on the line. I uh, see. So, I'll see. All licenses. Okay, that's, that's not important here. And okay, here we go. This is the key. Right here. Um, no extreme wrestling event shall be held by a promoter who has been licensed pursuant, unless the promoter is... Okay, basically what they, they do is is that the um, they have to to do to promote an extreme wrestling event. This is where they're going to get shut down. And this is what the whole idea of this bill is anyway. Um, they have... Um, let me see if I have it here. Okay, basically the promoter has to give at least 20 business days before holding the event, notify either the director of public safety in the municipality where the event is supposed to take place in some form with detailed, with such detailed information as the board may prescribe of the proposed holding of the event and receive per, per, approval in writing thereof. In other words, you've got to go to a local official at least 20 days before the show and get approval in writing from the local official or else you can't do the show. So that's where they're getting shut down. They also... Um, if you're an extreme wrestling promoter and you give out comp tickets, you're gonna love this. Uh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Um, uh, the identity of all recipients of this is only for an extreme wrestling, not for professional wrestling. The identity of all recipients of complimentary tickets, uh, uh, let's see, um, shall be included within the quarterly report on complimentary services required pursuant to. Basically, you've got to list everyone who gets a comp. <laughs> A quarterly report? Yes. Uh, let's see. They also have you also have to have two qualified physicians and an ambulance at the matches. So in other words, that's um, another big one. That's that's, that's a big one when you're drawing a hundred people, right? Yep. So anyway, it's an attempt to legislate this out of existence, but not touch the big guys. And uh, we've got Tom Zink on the line, the former Z man from World Championship Wrestling. And uh, how have you been doing lately? Pretty good. How you doing, Dave? I'm doing really good. Doing really good. Good. Thanks for having me on. Oh, you're more than welcome. Um, we heard uh, great reports from you from uh, the, the wrestling show, The Law in Toronto. Yeah, Jeff and Merrick. From Jeff Merrick, yeah. Yeah, good guy. He and Dan, right? From yeah, yeah. He says he told he told me like you know you've got to get Tom Zink on. And I go, hey, I know Tom Zink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been a long time. <laughs> yeah, really. So, uh, so what have you been doing with yourself uh, since getting out of professional wrestling? Well, right now I'm managing a multinational corporation here in Minneapolis, the production arm. I'm in the production field, and uh, I've got a very good pulse uh, from my coworkers at work about the wrestling scene. So, so, do, you watch, do you watch it pretty regularly or just some time to time? Yeah, once in a while. Just uh, no one's been talking about it lately, you know, because uh, it's not really hot. But about a year, year and a half ago, it was really cooking there. So a lot of guys around work would uh, talk about it. You know, big fans being former Z-Man, they always have a million questions. But uh, not too hot right now. Really? Uh, what do you think WCW's, WCW probably don't hear much about these days, right? No, you don't hear anything about that. It's only Vince's show. You know, not much about WCW. Um, it, there's no buzz about it. It's really worn off. From what it was. Now, you you of course spent many many years with WCW, kind of um, 
Your plight was very similar to a lot of wrestlers' plights in WCW in that um, they're pushed up to a certain level, and then no matter what happened, you don't get past that level. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you've been out of it now for many, many years, and a lot, and it really hasn't changed much either yeah. um, in that regard. I mean, it's different, you know, different different bookers. Bookers come and gone. Yep. But WCW has always been one of those things where it's just very, it's, it's you know, you can make good money. Yep. And you can get good exposure, but there's a there's that glass ceiling that you hit your head on, and and you're never you know, and, and some guys who have, who have left, you know, I mean, we talk about you know ob the obvious one like Steve Austin, and McFoley, who were there the same time you were. Yeah. Um, Hall and they Nash were able they to, left too. Well, Hall, Hall and Nash were earlier in their career, but yeah, yeah. yeah, Scott Hall Scott Hall wasn't too bad. Then Nash was a little too was a little too green, but yeah. they left. They went somewhere. Now, if you go somewhere and then come back, they'll push you as a superstar, but somehow they they are unwilling to create their own superstars, I guess. They, with I, a few exceptions. I don't know if they don't know how to. I can't believe that they're that naive, that they don't know how to push stars. They don't create anyone. It's a lot cheaper than buying back guys that are overpriced. I mean, where are their big money stars now, the million-dollar guys? I don't see anyone other than Ric Flair, and I call him the bishop because they – they crap on the belt, and who do they give the belt back to? Flair, right? Yeah. There's no star quality people that I see there. How come Vince, the big machine, WWF, they use you right. They turn you into somebody. He knows how to do it. WCW, they're floundering. They're the laughing stock. It pays good as long as you keep your mouth shut and you call. it's called in the business you play the game like a surfer. You're just riding the wave. Keep your mouth shut, do what you're told, and that's that. The guys that are hired, they're hired for a spot, and they never, ever advance. Benoit, he didn't advance, did he? He played the game. He's a great guy, kept his mouth shut, didn't create any waves. Where did it get him? Where did it get him, Dave? It got, he, WWF. He, they, yeah, he ended up in WWF, and now he's, uh, he's, he's at least getting the chance. Have you ever – oh, my hat's off to him. He should have done that a long time ago. What I, my point being, Dave, have you ever heard of wrestlers quitting on guaranteed contracts up towards of a half a million dollars to go for no big guarantee? Like you ever heard that? It's very rare, but they. But don't you think that also at, at, the, at this point in their lives, because you know you're talking about those guys. Yeah. I mean, Malenko, Malenko's right about Malenko's actually 40 right now. Oh. But uh, Eddie, Eddie Guerrero and Benoit, they're both about 33, and it's kind of okay. like if they didn't make their move. You know, they were going to lose their prime years. Exactly, Dave, exactly. When I was down at WCW, it was a waste of my life, my personal time. It paid in that, but what I'm saying, my wrestling career, to do the right thing. The time is now for Chris Benoit. Uh, hand him the ball. Let's see what he can do. It's time for him to run with it. They're stagnant down at WCW, and I'm glad. I'm very happy for him, and I like watching them that they made the right move. It took a lot of guts, and he did the right thing. I just hope he gets used right. In the WWF. What's your, what's your thought? Um, you know, haven't been there. Yeah. And, and you know, what, what's your thought on um, as why? You know, I mean, is it just that the the because sometimes I think it's like that the, the the brass at Turner yeah. is so consumed by what they consider star power that they consider like no matter what the business is, the guys that they have on top because they were once stars and they did draw money at one point. Yeah. A lot of them, most of them actually, that that they must still be stars. It's kind of like, you know, they have that TV star aura, and then a young guy, you know, they'll just dismiss them because, you know, I mean, there's, you know, as, as we all know, you can always find fault with any wrestler, and oh, yeah. unless, they, unless they've proven it somewhere, you can always go, well, has he ever drawn money? And the yeah. point is, is that we, we all know, unless you're put in the position to do so, nobody ever will. That's right. That, they put the knock on you. I don't care if it's for drugs or he never drew any money. They put a rap on you, and they brand you that, and all the guys... You know, they echo that, and it's like a wave. It's just they put the wrap on, you can't get anywhere. Vince McMahon, he knows how to create it. He has different guys work with Austin or different people, and they get that rub off, so to speak, you know, that I read on the Internet in you know, those terms. Uh, they create stars. They put them, they enhance them. You know what I'm saying? It's like athletic acting there, and it's a lot of action. It's, a, it's totally different. They know how to use people. I, the Turner people, they're TV people. Like Hulk Hogan, I think they think Hulk Hogan's like Elizabeth Taylor in Hollywood, okay? I think that's the star quality they think of Hogan. He's made a name. He's made a few B-movies. And I think they really think they have somebody, you know? It's not – nobody at Turner has taken the time in 10 or 12 years that they've owned it 
to really be a fan or to study wrestling because it's a very unique business. And no one's learned how to uh, manipulate the carny people or wrestling people back or how to draw money, what to do. No one's been a student of the game of wrestling, I think. I think that's their biggest problem. I, 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 com- I, I You know, there's people in the company who are, but they don't, see, they don't seem to advance either because it's always... Um, sometimes I wonder... I mean, it's just different people get the positions, and you know we've gone through, and you you went through the di- the different people. Jim Hurd yeah. at the very beginning. He Jim was Hurd, a very, he was a very nice guy, Dave. He yeah, was he a, was a very nice guy. I was I was friends with Jim Hurd, but the uh, fact is he didn't he didn't know wrestling. Oh yeah, but don't and, you and and Kip, and Kip Fry? I thought Kip Fry was a good guy too, and he didn't know wrestling either. Okay, but don't you think those committees? I think they did the wrong thing. When I was hired there, I was promised a top spot, a Ken Luger, Sting, and Flair. And Sullivan, Jody Hamilton, Jim Hurd, Jim Barnett, they had, it looked like, you know, those dogs playing cards, you know, sitting around the table, you know, with the dim light. All these faces bobbing their head, shaking their head, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh. They all know the business. No one stood up for me. Jim Ross was there. I mean, they just, they confused the Turner people. I don't know why, because it's so counterproductive, the game that they play down there. And it is a game. You know, they're getting the money, and look where it's, 61 million, is that true? I heard it's projected they're going to lose 61 million. Yeah, yeah, that's the projection for this year. How can, how can that be? How <laughs> I don't can know. that be? For God's sake, you own cable TV, you got satellite, you create it, you manipulate people. How can you not, you know, how can you, how can, when, the, when the economy is booming, how can you not draw people when Vince, it should mirror it to some degree, right? Well, when, when when the business is hot, I mean, you should you should you know, the thing is, is that they've created this atmosphere where one company's cool and one company isn't, and yeah. and and you know how the public is, you know, especially when it comes to wrestling. Wrestling's either in or it's out. Yep. And uh, exactly. you know, it's it, it's it flourishes like crazy when it's in, and when it's out, it's like, man, you know, you have trouble giving the tickets away. Exactly. And they were papering people. You know, I'd like to thank some of the guys on top. They didn't have to draw back then, and it was slow in the early '90s. But they're making big money. And they didn't draw then, and I guess they've come full circle. They drew it. Now they're not drawing now. How, you know, how is that? Same guys on top. We're going to start with Todd in Maryland. Todd, you're first up with Tom Zink. Hey, Dave. Hey, Tom. How are you guys doing today? I can barely hear you. Speak okay. up, Todd. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I had a couple questions for you, uh, for you Tom. Um, the first one was sort of what you were talking about earlier in terms of upward mobility, because when I first started watching wrestling, was right around 1990, 91, and I remember seeing you would get, like, a push for a little while, and then you'd job to someone, or, you know, there was this whole, like, push where you had the winning streak, and then you just job to Bobby Eaton and Star Kid out of nowhere, and then there was this thing where they did this pile driver angle with Lex Luger, if I remember properly, and then all of a sudden, when you were coming back, it was like teaming with Johnny Gunn or something, and I was wondering whether there was anything more to it other than just sort of booking an aptitude and unwillingness to push uh, young talent. Dave, can you repeat? I can hardly hear him. Okay, he was just—he was yeah. just pointing. He was actually going through pretty, pretty detailed um, some of the, the, the your career in WCW, where you would get like a, a push for a while. But one time they did a winning streak gimmick with you, and then all of a sudden it would stop, and then you would get another push, and then all of a sudden it would stop, and then, you know, that, uh, some of that might also be changes in bookers because they would change okay. bookers fairly regularly. Okay, great question, Dave. When I was hired there, Ric Flair was the booker. He was the babyface booker, and I mean. He's the only one that did good by me. I got a push there for a while when I first came in. Then they teamed me with Brian, and that's what they said when I met with all of them around the round table. Uh, two young baby faces, you know, to draw the young female girls and, uh, you know, the crossover. And then all of a sudden, Ole came in. And then Ole got sacked. I think it was back to a booking committee, and uh, Jim Ross was on it, Barnett, Jim Herder, uh then I got a push there for a while, and I think it was, you know, Flair was back in power, too. Um, then Dusty came in. I got buried. They buried me with Dusty because Dusty wanted to push the natural dust and his son. Then Bill Watt came in. Bill Watt pushed his son. All the cronyism, the nepotism, that didn't help me out. And the funny thing, after 10 years, it's all come about the best Vince could do is put him in a fat man suit. This is Dustin, by the way. A fat man suit. Uh, give him makeup and a wig, and go to the ring. And now he came back, he floundered again. So the whole business of wrestling is corrupt. And hard work, I don't think Pillman's death, I mean, I don't think he was so 
happy with, I know he never wanted to leave WCW. I feel very strongly about certain things like this. Rick Rude said, they don't take pills or get whacked out because they're so happy. They manipulate in wrestling and they play a very nasty game. I feel very strongly about it. How come WCW or WWF doesn't help out Melanie Pillman? Where were they? I'm sorry, I don't mean to go off on a tangent, but there, you know, there's a lot of things that I feel very strongly about that should be addressed. You know? Mm hmm. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to run off like that. Just break oh, no, that's my, okay. just okay. break Todd, my Todd. eyes, Dave. Yeah. Uh, Todd, yeah. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Todd. Okay, um, yeah, I was, my other question, I was just going to, referring back to actually what you're saying, um, Tom, about your tag team partners, I was wondering who your favorite um, tag team partner was. Who was my favorite tag team partner? Yeah. Yeah. The most, okay, the favorite tag team partner in and out of the ring was Brian Pillman. Far and away, we had a lot of fun. That's when he was single, and I was single. We were running around having a good time in the ring and out of the ring. We just figured, hey, if they're not going to use us right, we're going to have fun after hours. So we turned up the heat going out and uh, had a great time. So they didn't wreck our fun, but they wanted, or Oli, I should say, wanted us to quit because guys shouldn't be making 156000 when they could get the Rock and Roll Express or other guys that worked for them over the years for half that. They want to manipulate. They didn't mess with Luger or Sting, by the way, just the lower end. Okay? They had to control people. As far as potential, Rick Martell, he was a good friend. I got let down because he got a different contract than me, and it was about money. But Martell and I had great potential, very similar in look, good body structure. I think we'd have gone unparalleled. You know, I, I mean, I knew it was over after six months. It was just unfortunate with what, what went down there. Why do you think Luger has stayed on top all these years with all the different bookers and uh, questionable amounts of talent? Pardon me? Oh, yeah, why, 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 yeah. Well, you know, I, I think that what happened was Luger was brought in. I, I can almost answer that. Luger okay. was brought in by Jim Crockett in 1987 or 88, whatever year that was. I think it was 87. Yep. With, with, with the idea that, that, I mean, he got a huge contract yep. after his first year in Florida, and they had yep. decided he was, you know, people had been convinced he was going to be the next Hulk Hogan. So he was in that spot. Yep. And they never took him from that. You know, today, up until today, he was never really taken from that spot. Why Whereas is that? If, I, I think it's just because he had the spot. Yeah. So, you know, it's like it's like a Sid Vicious. It's like, you know, like they 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 put you in that spot, and then sooner or later the people just accept you in that spot. Whereas a mid card guy, yep. they just they're just hard to give you that 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 boost. But don't you, know, you it, don't you think like in the WWF they can build you up and then they beat you on that build you up for two years if you go after a year or six months the people or anyone let the people decide to give them a little push if you see star quality and talent, uh, and let them run with the ball. You know, you've got to be put in that position to draw money or to be popular. You know, you don't you don't get over by getting beat. Now, yeah, well, WWF, WWF, the one thing with WWF is, is they're willing to take guys and go to the top with them. But even so, even in WWF, I mean, if, I, if you really think back, at even like The Rock and Triple H, okay, from day one when those guys came in the company, management of that company uh, waved a magic wand on both of them, and it stalled many, many times. But they kept waving that wand, and eventually they became the two biggest stars in the in the industry, as they pretty much them and Austin are right now. Why do you but, think? Yeah, go ahead. But but I mean, but I mean, it was one of those things where I mean, I remember when you know, I mean, before Rock had his first match, I yeah. there were people in the WF who told me that this guy's going to be the number one guy in the company, and you could tell when they first brought in Helmsley from WCW, you know, where it was John Paul Levesque. I mean, they gave him gimmick after gimmick after gimmick, and, and eventually he made it, and I, I don't regret, you know, I mean, and, and he's great now. But but it, it's still the same thing. They, you know, there's a lot there's there's a lot of guys who they didn't wave the magic wand to because they weren't, you know, I mean, I see with those two guys, it's, you know, big guys with good physiques and, you know, good hair. You know what I mean? <laughs> Hello? Is everybody there? Yep. You're there. Is Tom there? Somebody. Tom. Hello? Hello. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I was actually just about to leave, but I was going to leave you with a quote before I left. Yeah, hold, hold on. Is, is Tom there? Uh oh Tom is not there. Okay, Todd, you go ahead, and we'll try to find Tom. Okay, just just um, after Russo's, like, Superman effort, where he actually was longer in the figure four for longer than the average length of a match on Nitro, I have this <laughs> quote uh, back from March of 1999 in the Raw magazine, Vince Russo himself. It's automatic. When the booker decides that he wants to become a television star, the rest is downhill. 
I'll sign off on that. Uh, um, 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 read, read that one. Read that one real loud, because I think Tom will really like to hear. It. Tom, did you hear that quote yeah. by any chance? No, Tom, say it again, please. Re read that one. He'll he'll appreciate this one. Vince Russo, March 1999. It's automatic. When the Booker decides that he wants to become a television star, the rest is downhill. Hmm. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, you know, it's it's to a certain extent. If you have yeah. To... Th Go ahead. Dave? Yes. If you, the Booker decides, but, I mean, some people, it's like throwing money into a furnace. You know what I'm saying? They just don't have it. They, it's like some of the sons. If they want to push their sons, don't push them ahead of their time. You know, they lose a lot of respect in the locker room with the boys getting pushed over someone that's paid dues or has talent or has a better body or can work better. You know what I'm saying? Well, well, don't, well don't you, doesn't everyone pretty much think that, that um, realistically, Bill Watts ruined, I mean, Bill Watts, in the attempt to give his son a jump start, basically yep. ruined his son's career because his son has never gotten another break because he's deemed Eric Watts. Exactly. The, the, the fathers set their sons up to fail, so to speak. You know, they put him over their skis. Uh, he wasn't ready for that spot. Yep. And I, Eric, to, Eric told me one time that his dad said if he got a degree, he'd uh, get him in the business. And it, maybe the sons, that's their dream, to follow in their dad's footsteps. But it seems the dads always have big shoes to fill. Look at Eddie Graham in Florida. Look at Greg Gagne. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's just, look at the Von Erichs. You know? Look at, look at the Von Bischoffs, Von Flair. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> it just, it, I see your stuff. I like it, Dave. It goes on and on. I'm not, you know, okay. They have an argument, okay? They did. A, it's like Dusty said about me. The word got back to me from uh, Dennis Brent. What does Z-Man's daddy do for the business? Well, my goodness. I mean, I showed I had a good attitude. I did jobs. I went with the program. I didn't quit. I'm no quitter. You know, I'd have ran, you know, ran the floor scrubber down at CNN Center for three grand a week. Come on, Dusty <laughs> Rhodes. You know, I mean, it's just really silly. Eric Watts, he's a good kid. I understand he's in Japan. I read the uh, Observer. And uh, how's he doing over there? He's he, 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 he got he got he got banged he got banged up a lot though on the first the first tour. Oh no, really? Yeah, just to, I think I hurt his knee and his elbow real quick. You know, it's, you know, I mean, you know, you were been there. It's a hard style there. Oh yeah, it is. It's like yeah, when I went back there after WCW, it was like, oh my God, I'm in over my head. It was okay in my twenties and thir early thirties, but you know, time time takes a toll in wrestling. I mean, I couldn't compete, and I didn't have it in me to do that again. You know what I'm saying? To do mm -hmm. that style, you have to come off the top rope, cross body, drop kick off the top rope, go over. They want you to do a planche outside of the ring, hit the uh, barricades, flip over, take that bump over the railing. You know what I'm saying? Give them some mm -hmm. action, you know? And anyone that knows wrestling, it's a young man's business. These guys now in WCW, it's like slow motion, you know? Well, it's Tom, you know, you're, you're actually younger than... A lot of the headline, a lot of the headliners there. Now, w when you walked away, yeah. okay, what, I mean, I mean, I don't see your name on indies anymore. I yeah. mean, it's like you, no. you walked away, and it was like you, you really walked away, and, and very few guys ever have done that. Well, you know, life goes on. You know, I mean, I love the business. I just, I think it's a shame what they've done to it. I think they're all, they should all be ashamed of themselves. Though, you know, who can look Ted Turner in the eye and say, "Yeah, I really did you right, Ted." Or Siegel. Give me a half an hour with Siegel. I could clue him in. I mean, my God, what they're doing there, there there's no excuse. What about that big-name talent? What, why aren't they? That's what the TV should be jammed with, you know? I got a different life now, you know? I mean, it's just it was frustrating. No one picked up on it. I thought going through Jim Hurd, uh, Kip Fry, Bill Watts, someone would have picked up on it. Somebody in the Turner organization would have got clued in. You know, I mean, that's a heck of a company to work for. After what I did for uh, AWA, out to Portland, to Montreal, to Martel's promotion, getting lied to about money, Dino Bravo's promotion the year before. I traveled around Japan nine times. I paid my dues and then some. I feel very strongly about what I'm saying here. I think you some know? of the Turner guys have been clued in, but they've been clued in by the wrong people. Oh, is that it? You think? Like, you know, the older guy saying, this is how it is, you know, these guys can't do whatever. Well, don't you think that then the other guys just bury them and say, oh, this and that, they trash them too? It's nature of the beast, right? Yeah. 
Um, it's or is nobody credible? I, I think that I think whoever is in charge is credible at that point. Uh -huh. And then and then you know and then there's always I mean one of the things with with WWF of course is that Vince is the guy. Yep. And ultimately, ultimately, like you know, no one can backstab Vince because it's his company. And, yep. and in WCW, you know, one of the things is is that whoever's in charge, everyone works at backstabbing them. You know, knowing, yep. you know, you know, because because they're all temporary. The wrestlers outlast, you know, the the, uh, the bookers and the uh, the administrators. What so. happened? What happened to that Bush? Bill Bush. Uh, Bill who, Bush was in over his head and who got, got him? Got, Word. Um, he was there from the early '90s in the accounting department, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, okay. same guy. Yeah, Jeez. and then uh, he was put in charge when uh, when Bischoff was sent home. Yep. And then uh, the numbers were the numbers were real bad. Mm. And the 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 thing where uh, they had that day where Benoit and Malenko and Eddie Guerrero yep. and all those guys when they all and Perry Saturn all went to WWF and he let them go in that manner. Isn't that uh, a sign? Yeah, that was that that killed that that ultimately I think is what killed him. Oh, okay. So and, he took the heat for those guys leaving. Yeah, 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 yeah. Although it was, you know, it was the advice people gave to him. And I, I, I can tell you that he was given the advice that if you give Benoit the world title, yep. he'll stay. And then the other three guys just, you know, let him, you know, and Douglas as well, just let him go because we don't need him. Benoit, but Benoit will stay. We'll give him the misread Benoit because Benoit just handed the belt back and left. <laughs> I didn't know that, really. Yeah. <laughs> that was really the mentality that was going down there. I mean, Bush was, Bush was told... You know, Bush was basically told that you know, I mean, you know, the only one that, that that means something is Benoit, and we can keep and we can keep him by giving him the belt. So they gave him the world. While well, there's a whole controversy going down, he was to leave all weekend. Yeah, he spent all weekend, you know, threatening to leave. Yeah. So then they gave him the world title, and then that next day, uh, he basically, uh, they they basically told the other guys to leave. Yep. Just, you know, leave leave Nitro, and they said, and, and Chris goes, well, if they go, I go. Well, you're the world champion. You have to defend the title. And it's like, well, if they leave, I leave. And then and then it was just like so he handed him the belt and he left. Whoa, what a dirty and, game! And then a couple weeks uh, later he was on WWF TV and uh, and that's that's the deal. This is something that that I I never had a chance to ask you and I'm kind of curious about. We I think we talked a little bit after this happened, but now okay. it's it's six years later and it's a totally different perspective. Looking back, since you were actually a part of this trial, what are your thoughts as far as the Vincent Man trial, your role in it, and just the just, just everything that happened? Because like it was all going on, and we used to talk as it was going on, and then then it was over. And you know, looking back, there's I don't know how do you view everything? Wow, what a waste of money! The government spent a waste of money on trying to you know get him. I don't know what was going on there, but uh, everyone knows that Doctor Zahorian was around, um, and I think my testimony or what seemed to me is that the um, you could get draws. I think they wanted to tie in that you could get money was made available that you could get draws to um, see the doctor or whatever. And um, I don't know. Drugs is <laughs> drugs are a part of our society. You know, uh, wrestlers now, Dave, as you well know, we've talked about drug use and anabolic steroids and the stance on that. They're a felony now. You can't get them, but Mexico, maybe Europe, but the guys now are huge. The guys bigger. are the growth hormone. I've heard that name around. I mean, guys are huge on TV. I mean, I, WWF, I at... WCW. Uh, I don't know. It's uh, what did it change? The whole deal in McMahon. I'm not familiar with his side of the story or whatever. But they flew me in from Japan to testify. They they really blew it for me in Japan, the United States. I didn't want to testify. I don't have a problem with the guy. He can run his business the way he wants. But yeah, it just really caused me a lot of aggravation. I'll tell you that. Yeah. You know. I, but I mean. It... What? As far as, as far as like uh, I mean, what 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 did you feel they were wanting you to say? And you know, as far as like the cross examination, and everything. How do you feel that all? How, how do you feel that all went? Like when it was over, you're just glad it was over and just go. I don't ever want to do this one again. Yeah, exactly. It was like, why are they messing with me? I quit. I left. I mean, and then it just you know it just keeps reoccurring. They they sued me for leaving, breach a contract. They bullied me like that. They disrupt. They turned my life upside down. Then all of a sudden, years later, uh, this whole deal, you know, about Vince McMahon and Zahorian and steroids, uh, you know, it was common knowledge. All the guys, everyone knew about it. It was like, oh, man, how did he get off all of a sudden? What was the final disposition on the case? It was just thrown out? The judge... The, 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 jury, the, jury, the jury voted him not guilty of uh, conspiring with Zahorian, which was oh, basically... Okay. That was how, it, how that one ended, and they had another one of... Of distribution with, uh, inv well, actually, what, what it was was Sahorian um, mailed steroids 
uh, to Vince yeah. and, for Hogan. And so they wanted oh. to charge Vince with distribution. And, and, and it came out, and I mean, no one denied that, that, you know, I mean, everyone basically admitted that Hogan, Hogan got steroids sent to a friend of his. Hogan got steroids sent to, to Hogan yep. uh, from Zahori. And Hogan got steroids sent to Vince McMahon's office where we'd go to the office and get the steroids. Oh, okay. So they tried to get that as kind of Vince distributing them to Hogan. And it's kind of a fine line whether he did or he didn't. But the, you know, I mean, it, it's not a fine line of what happened. I think it's pretty clear what happened. But the yep. fine line is, is that just is, is like if, 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 uh. Wasn't if it you, an argument that they shared? Their argument was that they. It was not that they shared. I guess that they shared, yeah. I mean, that's kind of how it was put. I mean, it was the the deal was is that they were trying to charge Vince with distribution because it was mailed to Vince and then he gave them to Hogan. Okay. Yeah, but they and were like Vin buddies, right? And they were buddies. So the idea was that they were trying to say, which they were, is that they would get the steroids, open the package, and divide them up. So it wasn't like it was a distribution. Yeah. And it, it turned out that whatever you would determine that never really actually got tried. The jury never voted on it because it happened in Connecticut and the case was in, uh, uh, what was it? It Long was Island. in New York, in the Eastern, yeah, in the Eastern District in, in uh, Queens. Was it, was it um, the Eastern District of New York? So they actually didn't have jurisdiction of something that happened in the office in Connecticut. And what, oh. what was, so that's why that case couldn't have gotten a conviction. So what they did was they tried to say that at one point, um, one of the steroid packages that, that Zahorian sent to Vince Vince gave to the limo driver who drove from Connecticut to the Nassau Coliseum, which was within their district, in their district, which yeah. was in the district jurisdiction, to give to Hogan. But they couldn't prove that that there was that that ever happened. And in fact, what was the most embarrassing part of that one actually is that the package that they alleged, just the package that they alleged, um, was sent. Okay, that yep. was sent on October twenty fourth. I believe the year would be 1989. I could be wrong, okay? But anyway, it was October. I, I remember these dates. It was October 24th that Zahorian sent the package FedEx to Vince with the steroids, right? Yep. And the show at the Nassau Coliseum that Hogan supposedly got the package was October the 18th. And when I found that out, watching the trial, I'm going, how can you make this? I mean, how did it get to all the way to a trial when the dates don't match? Oh, no. So that's, I mean, it went that, I mean, we, we, we got it that far. And that, that was, I think, the saddest thing, watching oh. that, because it, it, it's, they, they had, like, an argument for conspiracy. It wasn't very strong. But that distribution argument, it was just like, how could they claim, I mean, the distribution thing, they never had it within the district. And then the thing they had within the district, the, the dates just didn't match. It was impossible. Oh, unless we have, unless unless there was a time machine in those days that we don't that Vince invented that we didn't know about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny how the you know things happen. But you know, if they were buddies, and I'm sure you know Hogan and Vince were, you know, it's, oh wow. That, but didn't they have a grand jury and they had they spent all this money and subpoenaed people? Oh Ruth, God, yeah, everyone. They, they, spent, they spent years on oh. that case. But how did that fly? Who was the uh, United States attorney? Something with an Irish name, maybe? Uh, something with an Sean, Sean O'Shea. Sean, Sean, Sean O'Shea and um, 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 was Tony Valenti, right? Those yep, are the guys. That's it. That's it. And yeah. McDivitt was for McMahon and Laura Brevetti, right? Laura Brevetti was one scary woman. Oh, yeah. She, oh, <laughs> I, I take steroids from a trash can. She said about my character. It was that's like, right. oh, my God. And she, you know, after it was, after it was done, she kind of winked at me, you know, like after I, you know, she tried to light me up, you know, and implicate, you know, that I got steroids from my dad, who was a pharmacist, or family members. They trashed me, you know. And then yeah, they, they asked, trashed you. Huh? <laughs> they trashed you. <laughs> yeah, big time. So, I mean, it wasn't a pleasurable experience. It's like, oh, my gosh. I mean, how nasty they are. But, well, I, yeah, I couldn't believe it. The whole thing, I just couldn't believe he'd go after McMahon and have that week of a case. You know, McMahon's attorney, they slam dunked him, Sean O'Shea. It, yeah, it's embarrassing. Do you, do you want to know something funny though that came out after the case? Love it. Okay, is that the, the key the key witness in the case was um oh, what was her name? The, do you remember the secretary's name? Oh no, I I, I know who you're talking about. I, you know, I, I read it. Oh man, the name escapes me right now. The sec Vince okay. McMahon's secretary for a long time. She had a journal and it had like all these logs and there was a lot of steroid references in her logs, a yep. lot of them. Okay. Um, so anyway, the secretary was approached. Uh, uh, there's some articles that came out after the trial. Uh, yep. One in uh, Village Voice and one in New York Post. Yep. And the secretary was approached by a guy who who claimed to be an agent who wanted to do a movie on Vince, <laughs> or or uh, was was or and also. Uh, claimed to uh, be a 60 Minutes producer at the same oh, time, okay? Yeah. And so he got close to her yep. and was talking to her, going to represent her, and this and this and this and this, right? Mm -hmm. 
Do you know who he was? Who? Secretly, no one knew it. Who? The husband of Laura Bravetti. Oh, no! Yep. And when Laura Bravetti cross-examined... Uh, oh, Emily Feinberg. That's Emily Feinberg. It. That's and, how and, she fit in. Oh, Brave oh, no, that was her husband? It was her husband. And so when... I, I, I what see, a story. You weren't there, but I was actually there the day that uh, that Emily Feinberg was um, was on was test was on the stand. Uh -oh. And I mean, Laura Brevetti, I have I, I went I, I was like amazed. I thought Laura Brevetti was the greatest attorney in the history of the world. She had ESP. She like she knew the days that like Emily Feinberg was like on vacation, and she knew she knew everything. And I'm going like, oh my God, this attorney is the most well researched attorney, and she just ripped Emily Feinberg on the stand. And um, and then when it was over. Like, 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 I don't know, it was like a good year later when these stories came out, and I just, and it was like this light bulb hit, and I go, no wonder she knew everything. Oh, because, my God. So, anyway, so there's like that little, that, <laughs> that there's, kinda, a lot to the, there's a lot to that trial. I have no more questions, Dave. That's great. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. I didn't, <laughs> that puts all the pieces together. Real, real quick before we go back to the calls, um, sure. w w um, a lot of people have asked about this one. What's, you know, as far as, it's like your department, 1987, with yeah. Tom Zink. What's what's your side of the basic story? My side of the story was Rick uh, Rick's greed. I mean, Rick, you know, you know as well as I do, the guys, everyone makes their own deal. And Rick went down there. He went behind his partner's back. Dino, Bravo, you know, uh, Tony Muley, Gino Brito. That was his partners. He put money in the business. It was going down the tubes, and he bailed out. He told me that he was going to go down there. And make a deal, Can Am Connection. He was going to feed the idea to Vince, which he did, and he liked it. And Vince said to wear all white trunks. He wanted all white. Okay, so Rick came back with a contract for me to sign, and it didn't hit me until I remember this now. Reading Dynamite Kids book, uh, there was twenty-five bucks he got paid at TV. I don't know if my contract said twenty-five bucks or fifty bucks for TV, and it was like that's the only consideration monetarily in the contract. I said, oh, Rick, it was original what? contracts, yeah. Uh, I said, yeah, it was primitive. I said, Rick. And up to that time, I never signed a contract with Vern, with Don Owens, with International Wrestling in Montreal. Never. Never. And here I'm supposed to sign. I said, hey, Rick. I said, no. I said, I'm not going to say, hey, listen, you know, I went down there, you know, I went to talk to Vince. He didn't know who you were. He browbeat me. He gave me that whole spiel like the old timers, how they manipulate. And he really was charismatic and had a lot of fire when he was doing it, you know. And I said, well, I'll sign it, because I knew there was no money on the deal, and I'm sure I could get out of it before the merchandising hit, boring their attorney, just to be stubborn. They were bullying me. So that's why I left. Rick, he made the wrong judgment. The old-timers or guys think you should have stars in your eyes. They're too, most wrestlers are too lazy to work for a living or simply have never done anything but wrestle. You know, I love the WWF. I had a great time on the road. I like the lifestyle, the money. I'm embarrassed for Vince what he paid me. Didn't he know? But I suppose Rick said he had me under control. You know, and the French Connection, Patterson, Garvin, you know, Rene Goulet. All those guys are agents of his company, and, you know, that's, that's how they, they play a very, very tough game up there. No one gets over on Vince. He doesn't sell. You know, that's, that's just the way it is. Martel, he swerved me. You know, and you know it's too it's too bad. I mean, he said that I had a big head. No, no attitude, no big head. I asked him three different times. I said, "What'd you make last week? What'd you make for WrestleMania?" Oh, uh, uh, same as you. And then I read in his interview we did with you, and he said that Vince wanted him as a single when they had Ricky Steamboat and Macho Man. Oh yeah, everyone knows Rick's a real great interview. <laughs> when did they doing those uh, TV contracts? Huh? When did they stop doing those TV contracts when you only got paid like? Uh, no, they, they, like it was when you know I, I I'm not sure about this, but I think that that was uh, when Hall and Nash jumped in '96. Oh really? Yeah, because I talked to somebody that was there in like '94, and they they always said that for TV you only got paid like 250 bucks because they would go, we're putting you on TV and getting you over, so you know we're not going to pay you big money for that. We're doing you a favor here. Well, no, no, they said, well, I think even, well, now it has to be different because almost all of it's TV. Yeah. But I mean, even, you know, I mean, I remember even not all that many years ago, the, unless you were in the advertised main event at the TV taping, you know, you never made any real money doing the, the television match. So I remember, you know, like if there'd be a big house at the Cow Palace, just as an example, I remember one yeah. time they had like a big sellout house, whatever it was, 170 grand, which was a big deal in those days. Yeah. All of the guys on, all of the guys underneath 
got like, you know, their $50 or $100 or whatever the money was. And then the guys on top, which were Hogan and whoever he was working with, actually got main event money uh, from doing that TV taping because theoretically they, they drew the house, everybody, you know. Yep. But, um, um, what was I going to say? But I mean, as far as guaranteed money contracts in WWF, I think that they started doing the downside guarantees. Um, in '96, well, I don't know, but let's see. You know, Pillman and Pillman was one of the first ones who got one actually. Yeah. When Pillman really? left. Yeah, mm. he was one of the first ones who got a downside come. You know, because you know, because he jumped from WCW and they needed to do something to make him jump. Oh man. Recently. Well, he had Jim Ross in his corner, and Brian used to work Jim Ross. I got my game face on, Jim Ross. You ready for TV? <laughs> he was real good, and Jim Ross is a sucker for big guys. You know, he falls into that syndrome, and especially football players like Doc Williams. You know, yeah, that, well, that was always Ross's guy. Jim oh, Williams, sure, yeah. yeah, football. Ross wants to be happening. You know, finger clicking, yeehaw, Jim Ross. Hey there, you know, pretty boy. You know, that, but anyway, yeah. That's, okay, let's let's head to Nick in New Jersey. Nick, you're next up. Oh, hey Dave. Hey. Uh, I have a question for uh, Tom. Yeah. I understand that he worked in both the WF and WCW, is that correct? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, I was wondering what the big difference is behind the scenes, how the two are run, and uh, what are your comments? That's a great question. Okay. In the WWF, it's business. They're right down to business. There's no girlfriends. There's no dog. There's no... Nothing's discussed except wrestling. They've got a product to sell. Boom, boom, boom. You talk to Patterson, Gurria, any of their agents, and this is the big difference. Patterson will sit you down. I remember Tiger Chung Lee and maybe Iron Mike Sharp or someone was the tag team one time. Patterson explained the way it was going to go. We're going with these guys, the can -Am. You know, he just was really fiery, and everyone had respect for Pat, but that's the way the business works because Pat was a big main event. He drew a lot of money. Anyway. He told them how they wanted the match to go to bump, to fly around, to make us look good, because they were going to go with Rick and myself. And if there was any questions, after the match, we're going to come back here and talk about it if it wasn't the way that they wanted it done. In the WCW, Mike Graham comes in, Z, we want you to go out there, and uh, we got to get Vader over. we got to get a hot heel. They give you the bullshit, and, you know, it, it just sloppily runs. Ted Turner's got deep pockets, and a lot of people have taken advantage. They don't run it like a business for a public company. I mean, they got to be accountable. You know, they're running their, they're running the bookers and that when I was there. They run it like their personal business, like it's a family deal. They should develop a professional management team down there. You know, forget about the BS as wrestling's a special business. Nepotism, cronyism, you know, it, there's a whole track record of it. I don't know how they can't see it by now. You know, I mean, let let Flair take the company. Sign the company over to Flair. They can't live without him. He took the belt, showed up on Vince's TV. And then he came back and signed for more money. You can't kill Flair. You know, Flair's the man. Woo! There's nobody at the chemical company that goes nothing but woo! They don't go two times, two times, three times. No, no. They don't say it. They don't say slap nuts. They go woo! Z-Man, woo! <laughs> That's what they do. You know why? Because Flair knows the business. He loves the business. Okay? He comes through my TV. He chokes me in the living room when I'm having a few cold ones watching TV. The only reason why I tune is is for Flair. I told that to Jeff Merrick, too. He's the <laughs> same way. I'm a mark for Flair. Pillman was. Because he's the best. It's not, you know, bro, I rode down the mountain and, you know, brother... Come on. Flair's the guy. Sign the company over to him, okay? Yeah, that's my advice. You, you really, you know, did that clear anything up? Yes, yeah, that helps. Okay, brother. All right, thanks. Right on. <laughs> okay, guys, it's time for WF Daily Trivia. Here's today's question. Who has the highest, and if you read The Observer, you know the answer, so this isn't a difficult one. Who has the highest main event sellout percentage of anyone that has ever headlined Madison Square Garden, or ever headlined it more than a few times anyway, maybe... You know, one one for one doesn't count. Okay. So anyway, you can do that. And uh, we're back here with uh, Tom Zink. We're, of course, always here with uh, Brian Alvarez as well. we got a lot of emails and phone calls to get to. Let's go to Bob in New Mexico. You're next up. Hello, Bob. Yes, how are you doing today? Uh, my question uh, was, uh, you know, back when you were in WCW, back around in uh, 1990, you know, I can remember back then where they had a lot of uh, young guys that uh, were, you know, where I thought had a lot of potential to be really talented guys and uh, could have uh, been something bigger than they were, like uh, Tom, uh, Terry Taylor, Brian Pillman, Brad Armstrong, uh, Matt Bourne. Of, of course, I know about some of the 
things Brad and Matt went through. Uh, looking back on that, uh, what, what do you think is really necessary to uh, get the uh, excuse me to get the uh, talent uh, built up so that uh, they can go out there and draw? What what was really missing back then in WCW to get that done? Um, that's a good question. I'd have to say the Booker's agenda. Okay, we had. When I was there, when I first signed, I remember Shane Douglas, Johnny Ace, Lion Bryant. Um, you know, um, these guys, like you said, that they got lost in the shuffle. Dusty had an agenda. Dusty was pushing himself and Dustin. Uh, the bull drop in, baby. Dusty couldn't see past his own face. They just they run it like it's their company. He already had put the Crockett to bankrupt. I mean, how many chances does he need? Um, they don't. They push the guys that they can manipulate and control. That's what it seems to me. And Ted Turner has deep pockets, and some guys don't even have to show up to work, from what I understand, uh, even now. Um, Johnny Ace, he went over to Japan, and he's never come back. Shane Douglas, he had to take another route. He signed a year contract, and he took off. Uh, Tom, Tom real, real, real quick, just reminded yeah. me of something. You 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 were you were Shane Douglas for one match, weren't you? Yes, I was. I was a Mexican. And you know, <laughs> no one knew. Nobody knew. And yet Shane's back in back in WCW again. Pardon me. And yet Shane's, yeah, back, you said in Shane's back in WCW again. again. Yeah. Yeah. He finally got back after all these years. Exactly. But he had to go away for a while. Now, couldn't they have taken Shane and built him up slowly, slowly, and then only job to the, some of the top guys only here and there and not on TV where it would hurt you? But you got guys waiting in the wings in case some main event star gets injured, and a talent like Shane, he's an athlete. He could just fill in a spot. Pillman could do that. They never groom people right because some of the top guys will kill off their competition. Just like after WrestleMania three, Ricky Steamboat, a classic example. What happened to him? They gave the honky tonk man the belt. Maybe Ricky Steamboat stole the show at WrestleMania three. That's the match I like the best for wrestling, and I remember him, you know, doing a slide under the leg, baseball slide. They had a fantastic match, but I think some of the top guys killed the competition. Don't I'm mean to ramble. WCW right now. Well, it's 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 been the same. Uh, I mean, it's been the same, even even to an extent, WWF right now. Yep. Yeah, well, I don't agree that. And it's not it's not as bad in WWF right now, is it? But but. With WCW, I mean, the, the thing is, is like, like we're talking about. It's like Tom, here's Tom, who's been out of the business for many, many years, and there's a lot of guys on top. Basically, they're his contemporaries, or or a couple of guys that are a few years older. Yeah, exactly. But it's the same guys on top, right? For the most part, yeah. I mean, for like, how many Paige, years since the mid '80s? You know, Fifteen. Where do you, Dave? Where do you ever get a 15 year run in the business? Yeah. Well, where do you get? You know, no rotation. <laughs> same guys on top. They're not drawing money. Same guys there. How does that work? Unless, oh, I guess we're playing the game, or what? Have they got a special handshake, or a, you know, a certain sign, or what? What have they got? A little fraternity, or you know, what do they got going on? Something, because yeah. it's the same cast of characters. That's um, what I got to believe. Okay, Bob. Anything else? Uh, yes. Uh, one other question. Uh, I, we, I mentioned Terry Taylor, and of course he's still in the business, and he's uh, still backstage with uh, booking. Uh, just wanted to get uh, Tom's opinion on uh, Terry Taylor, and uh, would Tom think that Terry Taylor would be a a good person to be put in charge of a uh, of running a company like WCW? Yeah, what were your thoughts, of Terry Taylor? You Terry him Taylor? Okay, perfect. This is a great question. He's at the top of my list as a worker. He got screwed over worse than me. He, I, a guy like that, handsome, good looking. He dressed the part. He played the part. He was a nice guy. If you went in front of him, he would say nothing. He played politics. He's a great guy. He was a better worker than I could ever dream to be. We had we had great matches, and that's what I think. But it never went anywhere. He was a great worker, but that's one guy I can always any day that I feel wah wah bad for myself or my career didn't take off like I thought it should have. Terry Taylor. Then that brings me to reality. This guy had talent. He knows the business. He's a straight-up guy. I heard one guy say, Terry Taylor is too honest for the business or naive or whatever. But then I, I, don't, other think, people, I, don't, I don't think Terry Taylor's naive at all. I don't think so either, but you know what I'm saying, how they slam yeah. him. Or I've heard he's a stooge. So I'm, I've heard a lot of bad things about me, and I don't mean nothing personal about that, Terry. But he'd be the guy. He, w he would be the best choice. I think Terry was raised... 
I think it's all what you learn at home. I think he came from a good family, good upbringing, and, um, yeah, I think he would be a lot better. Or I'd welcome that than anyone else so far. I trust well, him. At least, it, at least, at least he's, he has no kids, and he does, you know, and he's a student, and he is a student of wrestling. He loves it. He loves yeah. the business. This guy loves it. I didn't have that love like he had. Martell had it. Uh, I think Vince McMahon loves the business. I know Pat Patterson does. There's certain guys, it's in their blood. It's in their blood, and he's a student of the game. Terry loves the business. And, he, you know, he's not second generation. You know, what's he going to do worse than Bill Watts or, uh, or, or Dusty? I mean, come on. I mean, Eric Bischoff? I mean, look what he's done to it. There's no accountability. It's just, you know, it's very frustrating. It's so easy, and they complicated her. You know, I, I I think the people who run the Turner thing. I mean, like the one thing with Bischoff is is that he was there for the big run. Yeah. And and then he it, stole it went... talent. That's all he did. Who did he create? <laughs> he stole Hulk Hogan, who Vince created, and he got Hall and Nash. Okay. Yep. He stole those two. Okay. How come the power plant didn't put out anyone? Dallas Page. Do you think that was the right thing to do with a 36 or 39 year old guy to train him? How did Vince miss on him? How did anyone? He's the Forrest Gump of professional wrestling. Two two knee braces? Come on. What do you think Lou Fez or Harley Race? How many? Two knee braces? And he's a champ? Come on. You know, don't you know, you can't fool me and I can say what I want. It's my opinion. This is entertainment, right? Yeah. But Let's you know, go, uh, real quick I want to mention something. This is from Scott in Maine and he said that uh he yeah. wanted to know if you have any good road stories about Brian Pillman. I have a couple oh, questions like that. How much time do you have? <laughs> how much time do you have? Oh, my goodness. Is that the Waldorf Astoria? Okay. We're there. <laughs> You're laughing. Did I tell you? Okay. I don't we're know at the Waldorf. Yet. Huh? I don't know it yet. <laughs> okay. We're at the Waldorf Astoria. You know, the best zip code in the country. Most expensive real estate. We're up there for the doll convention, the Galoob doll convention. Okay, so Brian was single at that time. We were both out roaring around Manhattan. So he gets a friend, uh, meets a friend, this chick, beautiful blonde, and uh, we go back to the hotel, and uh, I had met some other girl that was at the uh, doll show that day. So I'm in my room. We split up, and usually our deal was to leave the doors open, you know, in case, you know, you needed a toothbrush or some dental floss or something, you know, that we could walk in or, you know, a, a soft knock. Anyway. I'm in there with this girl, and one thing leads to another. All of a sudden, after about an hour or half hour, Pillman comes in, and he slides in, and we're, we're there naked. And uh, Brian says, hey, Tom, come here a minute. So uh, we had been out, had a couple of beers, and I said, what is it? He goes, I'll leave the light on in the bathroom. I want you to come in and hold my feet. I need to get some traction. So slide down low and hold my feet at the end of the bed. I'm going, oh, my God. So anyway, that was the story. <laughs> oh my God! Wild and crazy times. Pillman, Pillman was a gas. He was a wild man, and uh, yeah, he's truly missed. You know, it's, it's, it's too. What did, what did What did you think when you got the word that, that when he, when he died? Oh, uh, it was awful. He died in Minneapolis here. That's right, at the at the budget cell or something. Yeah, what a what a way to go out. Well, I talked to Ed Shark. He about, I said, what was going on? He said he got there early. They were in Winnipeg the night before, and he just walked in. He was like in a daze, and then he, he said he, he was like a guy. I called to him, Brian, do you need a ride? He just was like walking off into the darkness, that he said, and that was it. That's the last mm. anyone heard or seen of him. Wow. That was, yeah, it was terrible because, you know, we had good times, bad times. You know, when you hang around, it's not normal to hang around another male for 12, 15 hours a day to travel. You know what I'm saying? So it wears on you, the road anyway. Right? Training, you have to die to look good, all the BS that goes along with wrestling, the manipulating, the mind games. And, uh, yeah, he was a good partner. He was a good guy. It's, yeah, it's just, it's were, just a waste. I mean, were you, were you there, were you there when, when Brian and uh, Bill Watts had their problems? Were you still there? Uh, yes, yes, I was. Because I, I remember that. Because that was like, uh, Bill Watts just tried to totally, totally bully him to make an example. And I remember Brian was just like, uh, you know, okay, just job me out. I'm, I'm keeping my money. It, because we used to, exactly, we used to laugh about that. I mean, they thought their mentality was so naive or stupid how they, how simple Bill Watts and Ole were to manipulate us, to beat us, and we're going to quit on that kind of money when we never had that kind of money before to make in the business. All our years finally paid off. They were going to job us out, but here he pushes his son through the roof, but his son's getting paid at training camp. 
I mean, how was that supposed to make a guy like Tillman feel? He had just signed the contract. He was on cloud nine with Kip Fry. You know, oh, you know, um, the night that we had that match down in Florida, was it uh, Jacksonville? Tillman and I had a match. Oh, the singles match, yeah. Yeah, that was yeah. the first night that Bill Watt came in. So Brian and I, there was oh, a, you had that really, and you had a really hot match. And there was no follow up, was there? That's right. I, I never had. That. I, I never had any follow up with Terry Taylor, Chris Benoit, Brian Tillman. They did it to humiliate me by having the little guy beat me. It was fine, but we tried to steal the show because Chip Fry said, you know, you get five grand. The you know the best match gets five grand or whatever the figure was. We're going to split it and give the referees the money. So that's what Brian and my motivation was. And Bill Watts had just come in and gave that lecture in the locker room and lit everyone up. You know, went back to the old henchman style. I'm going to run this, you know, like promoters used to talk that trash to guys. Now they can't because, you know, publicly owned company. But back then, that's, you know, Bill just ran it like it was his own personal property. He got on there and he, you know, told everyone this and that. But how do you think Pillman felt just signing a contract and then right after it, a week or two later, Kip Fry has gone, Watts is in, and then he's busting his chops. Yeah, it's just like, it's like, okay, you know, Brian, you know, you know, you're going to have to give back this contract, but then yeah. we'll push you. But if you keep this contract, you're going to be in the opening matches. And it's like, oh, God. Yeah. How, how, can, can you imagine? Is, is it, is, you know, it's it like, yeah, yeah, they're going to pay whatever it was, like 250 or 300 whatever it was. It was real good money in those days. Yeah, it was like for, for an, oh, He was going to be the, the highest paid opening match guy in the history of the business at that point in time. <laughs> or, or he could be pushed and make, like, maybe half the money. That was, his, that, was, that was the way it was put to him. Yeah, but that's the old-timers mentality, right? Yeah. That we'll, we'll make you a star. It's like Vern used to say to me, I made you a star. I put you on my TV. I'm going, TV's a byproduct of your business. What are you talking to? He's just like, oh, God. They try yeah. and manipulate it. It's a real strong game they play, and they, you know, they talk down to you. Very condescending, and that's just old school. You know, that's the way they did business. Let's go to Dave in Pennsylvania. Dave, you're, Dave, you're next up. Hello. Hello. Hey. Hi. Um. I think, Tom, you've been a great guest. This has been one of the most uh, energetic shows I've listened to so far. Well, that's what it's about, baby. I have to say, keep it up. <laughs> Talk um, to me. Um, I'm pretty involved in uh, the Internet and wrestling writing. Um, I write under the name of Soups or uh, WrestleArena.com. Just because, I don't use my real name, just because I don't, don't want to have my personal email interspersed with, like, you know, Vince Russo Mark yeah. flaming me. But anyways. <laughs> um, too bad, I, Brian, I, Brian, you should have done that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we all should do that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and um, anyway, I was I looked, you know, Tom Zank was on tonight, and I was like, oh, I haven't heard a lot about Tom Zank, you know, lately. But um, I looked, I have two questions, really, but the first is, I looked on, a, in, on Yahoo, and I put in Tom Zank, and this website comes up, it just says Tom Zank, you click it, it's a GeoCities website, and it has, uh, <clears throat> like, columns and shoot interviews with Tom, and um, they're contradicting a lot of the things Tom is saying here. Like, um, there's, there's, there's one about the whole WCW Sullivan situation and uh, trashing Ric Flair. At the same time, I'm getting Ric Flair's the man from Tom. And um, <clears throat> there's other such, there's things about the radicals in there and that whole situation. And I'm thinking, well, Tom didn't, it was Tom's situation was explained to you, Tom. Um, I just don't really understand. Um, is, 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 is Tom a part of that website? or Is there a disclaimer on the website? It's a GeoCities website. What is it? www.tomzank.com? It's like a GeoCities, it's like a Tom Zank GeoCities website. So what do you... It's not TomZank.com, though. It's not TomZank.com? No. It has links to that. Okay. But it was it was just kind of bizarre, because it has things in there about you just trashing Ric Flair, about so some of the Ric Flair facelift and weird so, stuff. So how do you feel about the things that I've said about Ric Flair right now, about the business, and he's the man? Is that oh, accurate? No, that's what... That's what it's like, um, Is it accurate? It's just contradicting, you know? It's just... So what's well, your, well, well, hold on point. point. I'm not if he, if he I just, said... He do, if he I said just want to know if Tom said those things or not. I don't have any comments oh, okay, on okay. it. Is that a valid website? Like, is that something he's involved in? Because I'm not sure to if check it's it out. or not. Something on the Internet is not true. Uh-oh. How can Pardon I... me? <laughs> what, what's that? <laughs> something on the Internet that's not true. Yeah, hello? Hello? <laughs> the way that happened. I, I just wanted to know, because it's, he's plastered all over it with his comments, I just wanted to know if it was he was a part of it or not. There was somebody. Well, this is the up to date version of Ric Flair. Are you a Ric Flair fan? Hello. I can't really hear. I can't either. But, um, so let's go to well, another call. My second question is this: 
Um, <laughs> with Flair. Hello. 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 I'm here. Uh, my second question is with Rick Flair. Um, okay, if Rick Flair, I, I know what you're getting of at. Flair matches. I don't want to. I don't want to knock Flair or knock you. I've seen hundreds of Flair matches. Go ahead and knock. And I believe me. I've seen you wrestle Flair. Well, my point is, what was it like the first time you wrestled Flair? I only wrestled him two times. That match? Did he explain to you things beforehand? During the match, what spots did he call? Did he call a trademark spot? How did he do that? I'm just interested in how Flair calls the match and works the match. Well, isn't it isn't it pretty much the same? How that works? Isn't it pretty much the same match all the time? I've heard all the boys in the locker room go, "You see one Flair match, you've seen them all, but it's work. It's work for how many years? Thirty years? He's got all that TV time. He's the man. Okay. The facelift part. I see what you're trying to do. Okay. The facelift part. What I'm saying is, he gave his life. He's done. He's done what it takes. He loves the business. Mm -hmm. There's no denying it. That's more than I ever did. I wouldn't even have liposuction if I was fat. What I'm saying is, this guy lives, please. It's like I'm thinking he about promoting that. him he's from Bishop Flair to Cardinal Flair after the blood stripped that. on him. Flair, look, pardon? He's Flair. You can you can knock his booking. I'm not talking Flair about tried his to put booking. himself over, but Flair, whether you knock his booking or not, he pushed wrestling. And he did it. Well, I really, always liked Flair as a booker. I think we've got common Flair ground now. That's right. Very he, good pushed, for him. he pushed wrestling, and he knows Flair, the... that was the best booking ever. Maybe Flair was on top. Flair should be on top. Flair's been buried for ten years now. What do you think? Or, what do you think about what? It's what do you think? What do you think about what Bischoff and Hogan are doing to him now? They're sitting back, waiting oh, in the think, wings. Don't I think you think? Now. I just think it's bad for business. It's bad for them. That's but, right, but. Have, it's Do you bad. know any other business that's so counterproductive, what they're doing to WCW? Ted Turner, it was fantastic for wrestlers when that came along. Look at how many guys have made livings by that. What happens if that folds? Mm -hmm. That's what they're not. They're going for the quick kill. You know what I'm saying? They mm -hmm. could do a lot better. When it's hot, when wrestling's hot now, how do you lose $61 million? How do you lose $17 million in 1999? Jeff Merrick, he told me that. He made the point. Yeah. That's really wrong. It's disgusting. Flair is the guy. Flair gets ratings. I look on the Internet. You can't believe everything you read on the Internet. Oh, I do not. But what I'm saying is it all points the, is the ratings don't lie. It's junk. Why doesn't the WCW, what they've always sold is wrestling, why don't they go back to it? Let the people give them another product. They had the best wrestlers, Benoit, Perry Saturn, good bodies, guys that could they go. Give them 15-minute matches. Mm -hmm. Let's give them a give them a different product. All that, you know, the sex, the you know, TNA on TV. Do you think I remember seeing wrestling when I was ten years old and said, "Hey, I can do that." That's your formulative years. You think that's good for America? America wanted to see that kind of stuff. Give them a different product. They're out of the south. All okay. Right. Well, thanks for having me, Dave. I appreciate it. You're getting tons of fan mail, Tom. The, Are they, they trashing me, Dave? No, they're not. They're okay. saying you were. They're saying that you were better than. Do you, do, you, do you ever meet bad news, Alan? By any chance? No, but he called Vince McMahon from Danny Crawford. Told me this. You're gonna like that. He called Vince McMahon. He's the devil in a suit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I laughed so hard, Crawford, when I, he told me that in Japan. No, I heard he's a real character, a good guy. Bad, bad news, Alan was one of my favorite interviews. This is we had him just not, not all that long ago, about two weeks ago, and yeah. uh, and people are like the, the emails are basically like this this is this is as good as Bad News, Alan. In fact, one person said it's even better. So oh, really, so you're being compared to a, yeah, that's a pretty high standard. We had some good interviews the last like yesterday with uh, Edge was really good too. Oh really? Uh, well, a, lot, a lot of them have been good lately. So after this, is, this show, I know what the guy's talking about. That Geo Cities is www.tomzink.com. Tom Tom Professor mm -hmm. Rod Dixon in Australia will answer any questions, and Lee McMichael down in um, Valdosta, Georgia. They're the webmasters. I know exactly what he's talking about. I had a you know brain fart for a minute there, but uh, it's nice to know some people are reading the web page. That's how they can get a hold of any questions or whatever, you know. Yeah. Was that a setup call, Dave? Uh, they, I, I, you wouldn't I, do that to me, would you? It was out of no, the East Coast. I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't do we it. Okay, just, it. I'm sure he did. We don't. We don't set it up, but I'm sure someone did. Yes. Yeah, whatever Brian Alvarez in there first for the name of the web page, uh, it's always set up. Yeah. So that rant he was talking about, maybe I was trying to draw heat because you know I'm a frustrated heel and trapped in a baby face body and face. So maybe I was trying to get a little heat to jack the numbers. Okay, is that legitimate? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't know. Let's go to Adam in Brooklyn. Adam, you're next up. Oh, hey, I'd just like to say I'm a big fan of Tom, and he's done some miracles like carrying guys like Van Hammer and Vinny Vegas, like in the past. And I was yeah. just wondering, you know, since he worked with, uh, you know, Paul Heyman in the past, what does he think of uh, Paulie now and uh, ECW? Uh, I 
don't know. What's with the tables? Do people like to see those guys go through the tables? Or is, That's what, like a real that? good thing right now is, is guys going through tables, yeah. That's just a yeah, high that... spot. What? I mean, someone's going to get hurt, right? I mean, there's they, no... They are, they are, so, pe people do. The people... Sometimes they... You know, the, oh. you know where you get hurt is like sometimes the table will splinter wrong. Yeah. And if it can get your, near your eye, that's where that's that's the scary stuff with the tables. I, I, was, I, don't, I, I don't... Brian, what, what's your thoughts as far as the tables go? I think last night on Thunder when Sting was given that... Uh, your nagi on the table and it did not break. That was that bad. was scary. When the table I doesn't that, break, that's bad news. I, I mean, saw once a road dog in a match with I think it was D'Lo Brown, but D -Lo, I, I'm pretty sure it was, but D'Lo Brown or whoever it was it might have been Al Snow, but but it was road. I remember it's Road Dog. He got power bombed on a table and when it didn't break, I was thinking like, oh my god, broken ribs. Like, he 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 ended up being okay. He didn't miss any matches, but at that moment it was oh. just like, oh boy, really. Yeah, they can. You know, someone's going to fracture something, or you know, there's no future, no longevity in that. But I mean, the fans. I mean, you know, you've seen that once. Oh, here comes the referees in the ring, and you know, I refereed, Dave. I had licenses all over the country. I mean, I had a flourishing career as a referee. Dusty, thanks, Dream. He maybe do that. Uh, but anyway, you pull out, you pull out a table under the ring. Where does that fit into the picture of wrestling? I don't get that. I don't follow the psychology. It's the, just, it's just what it is. Do people really <laughs> like that? Yeah, yeah, they really do. It's oh, like the gosh. big in thing, yeah. Really? Yeah. I oh, think wow. it kind of hurts, like, the psychology of the matches. Like with the Dudley boys, you know? Yeah. They well, prove... it, bre it, breaks, it breaks a certain aspect of it when you... The, the, the thing about the table is everyone loves the break, and everyone yeah. loves the anticipation of the break, so it, it, it gets over. Oh. But to me, the, the things that kill it is that it takes so long to set the spot up, and that, like, the guy who's selling just has to sell a ridiculously long time yeah. to make the spot work. So that's the negative of the spot. That's what I always uh, thought was kind of wrong with, like, Sabu, you know? Yeah, like I was. Yeah. Uh, he's a very hard-working wrestler, but a lot of his spots in match are very, you know, contrived and like ridiculous and they're like take, take so long to do. That's that's what I thought really hurt him in, when when he went to All Japan, is that like you know I would watch him do this and it's like in the context you know that All Japan mentality where where it looks real and yeah. it looks like it's an athletic contest and then you see those spots that take so long to set up even though they're brilliant they're great spots it was always like. In, in in that context, Sabu to me didn't work. When it was an ECW, Sabu worked when he hit the spots. Where it didn't work is when he would like do the same spot four times in a row because the first three times he would slip, and then it was just like you know, oh god. Then that, to me, that then it looks like that that was when Sabu didn't work in ECW. When it you know when sometimes he did work when his spots hit. You know, it was it was spectacular stuff. Well, in Japan, like I think tables mean a lot more. Like I was watching um this Toriyaman tape with uh, Magnum Tokyo and Great Sasuke, mm -hmm. and they did this like great spot where. Sasuke does his, you know, his special over the top rope through a table, like, but the table didn't break, you know. Oh, but that's gotta hurt like crazy. Yeah, to Magnum Tokyo. <laughs> oh man. You know, dude, that's like that's basically a dive, but you land on a table that doesn't break instead of landing on the guy catching you. Oh, that's oh, oh. like concrete, huh? Yeah. yeah. Wow, you can't make a living at doing that, huh? Ooh, not I wouldn't for, do not it. Not for a long time. No, that wow. Yeah, I hope you know someone's gonna get seriously hurt, or I see on the internet, oh, that someone's gonna die in the ring, or. You know what I'm somebody, saying? Somebody just, somebody just did it on Wednesday. What? A week ago Wednesday. Seriously? Yeah, I, it was a, in, cool. an independent show. A guy, um, a guy, a guy landed wrong on a choke slam and broke his neck and died. Oh God! Yeah. I've yeah. been calling it a choke slam, huh? No, no, press slam. Press I'm sorry. Press slam? I said, yeah, the press, press, press slam, and then he was dropped, and I guess he landed at a bad angle. Anyone I know? Uh, no, 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 because okay. I'd never even heard of his name. Right. Mark Mendlin. Oh, okay. Yeah. I've been to a lot of Jersey Old Pro shows, you know. Yeah, where they're coming down hard now. Yeah, and it's you know, I I, I, I want to ask about Jersey All Pro because you know I've never seen it. Well, um, tell me about Jersey All Pro. About Jersey All Pro? Okay, like as far as as far as as, as far as like you, you tell me about it and and do they do stuff? Do they do? Is there anything in particular they do that that you don't see on the other promotions that yeah. would make them different? Yeah. Um, okay. They use a lot of mouse traps. Um, oh, I don't hate that. Yeah, I know. Mouth traps, a lot of fire, you know, like like setting things, tables on fire, like that flash paper. No, real fire, match. Oh, oh no. Yeah. But WCW just WCW just used fire uh, last night with Vampiro. They set that table on fire. No, but one time I went and the promoter's a wrestler, Frank Davia. You know, you talk about him. I, I I I know of him. Yeah. Yeah, he had this match where he wrapped his arm up in tape, right? And he like lit it, uh, you know, with gasoline or something, and then he set his arm on fire and did a clothesline. Oh. The guy. Oh. But then. He, the fire wouldn't go out, so he was running around like crazy in circles. And he ran to the back where one of the managers put his arm out with the fire extinguisher. Oh no! Yeah. Oh god! They don't even know how to put it out. You got to smother it with a towel. You got to kill the oxygen, right? Yeah. Oh no! And they're doing that. See, that's how people get carried away. You know that it's the adrenaline or uh, there, there's 
you know, I don't know. The guy I, could do it. Love it, you know. Huh? I like addicted. Uh, yeah. Well, every well, you know, Tom, you know that you know about the guys that you know th th that are addicted to the pop. I mean, oh, God, you know, that's yeah. why guys can't walk away. Yeah, yeah. But, but, like you know, a lot of them stay a lot past their prime, you know, and that yeah. really waters down the product, especially when they don't do jobs. What's with doing jobs? How many jobs has Flair done? And he's the most popular thing. Guys aren't smart enough to pick up on that. You know, the Rock. I, yeah, I, the Rock's doing jobs too. Well, the Rock doesn't. The Rock doesn't have a problem. With, you know, the thing is, is is um. It's 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 interesting that that the you know what's funny now that I think about this what's think that? about this one he's got a ton of charisma though the Rock uh, like like no one I've ever seen on this exactly okay. but think think about this do you know if you think about it, like a Booker okay for the yep. most part uh, should be the one who you know manipulates things like that you know the, the, the guys if you look at guys who booked a lot whether it's Kevin Nash or Dusty Rhodes you know when they're baby faces they, the the ones who are bookers are the ones who really hate to do the jobs that's right that's right With Dusty. Dusty, like, I mean, you could say now he's 55 years old and he's wrestling in ECW and he put over Steve Carino. That's one thing. But, I mean, when he was in his day, that guy never did jobs. And, like, you know. And he took, uh, and, he, and he had the horseman feed. He could take on five, six guys. Where do you think these other guys learn it from, right? <laughs> That's what these guys are doing all these spots exactly. from that we They're saw doing last the night. Dusty stuff. It's yeah. like, oh, no, it's so simple, the psychology to figure it out, you know. Well, they, yeah. you can say the same thing for kind of like Ric Flair. I remember I was watching, um, like, our video did a shoot with Vader. Yeah, mm -hmm. he was talking about how in 1994, um, Vader and Flair were supposed to have this cage match, uh, to the rematch from Starcade. They had a really good match then, remember? Yeah. The Starcade match, yeah, the that was a really classic match in Charlotte, yeah. Yeah, and then Dusty Rhodes is Booker, and then the week before the cage match where Flair, where Vader was supposed to get back to the title, or so he says, you know, Flair became Booker, and they changed the whole angle and uh, Flair won the title back or kept the title. Well, that, that 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 happens all the time, and, and believe me, there are plenty of guys who've been told. I'm sure that Vader's telling the truth on that because that's probably how they would have done it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I remember, but I remember when wasn't it was it Hogan and and Vader in a strap match where Flair was the one who did the job. Yep, in drag. <laughs> in drag. That's right. Well, oh, they just geez. did that uh, a couple months ago with Luger and Flair in the strap match, or Flair and Hogan in the strap match, and Luger got B too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind. Of, it's kind of funny how they are. It's, uh, you know, people. I don't. I don't know the whole job thing. It's. It's been, Flair. He. He's proved it wrong. So uh, it's just an ego thing and what they think. It's among the boys. It's all. You know, it, it's really hurt them more than anything. They can't pull that in the WWF. But then you got the fool Bischoff that signed these guys that have say so in their contract, whether they win or lose. You know. Well, Hogan's the one. Hogan's the one who has that, and Hogan's Hogan's the, Hogan's one of the best I've ever seen as far as being a manipulator. Oh, really? I heard that. Uh, Pillman told me this. The last time I talked to Pillman was for like three hours on the phone one night, and uh, he said that they were faxing the finishes to Hogan where he could check off. Is that is there any truth to that? Oh, I bet that's true. Yeah, because because he was he was Hogan. They they used to do um, this is when the, the period when they were hot. Yeah. You know, so this is like ninety six, ninety seven. Exactly. That's when he was talking about. Okay, I mean, I remember that, uh, you know, they would come in and whoever was putting together the TV, whether it was Sullivan or whatever, he would put together the TV and then, like, you know, Eric and uh, Hogan would come in and it would be, like, totally different. And then, I mean, it actually was doing very well in those days, but when, it, you know, when segments looked bad, you know, then that was great was that everyone could point the finger. I, I remember, Brian, me and you used to talk about this. Yep. This was when Nitro was really falling bad. So this is when Nash was Booker. And, like, every Tuesday, and these, these were some, these were, these shows were much worse than the shows now. Okay. Um, and and Tuesday it would be like I would get phone calls from different people representing every faction. It would be like oh, the, the friends of the friends of Hogan would go, well, you know, we just, you know, it's like Hulk just did what he wanted, you know, Hulk just did what he was told. Hulk had nothing to do with this. Yeah. And the friends of Nash were, you know, I know Kevin's the Booker, but Hogan's doing it's all Hogan, it's all Hogan. And then Eric was just like, I gave all control to Nash. <laughs> it was like this finger pointing every Tuesday morning. Um, you know, this was this was this was when the shows were were this, well, this is when they really had the fall. Like now it's. They're they're at this level and they're staying at this level, but this was when they fell from that like that mid fours down to the um, you know low threes. You know. Uh, well, Dave, um, that's like go back to Flair again because like when Nash first came in as Booker, yep, they were putting on really good shows. Like the pay per view string they had, they did uncensored. That was a great pay per view. Spring Stampede last year, and as soon as they started to turn Flair into this like crazy old man, everything right, right went down the shitter, you know. They really, that was bad because Flair was real hot then. But, you know, Flair, you know, part of that was Flair. Flair wanted to go heal. I don't think he, I don't know that he wanted to go to, in the insane asylum business because no. that was, that was not a good one. But, 
No. But Flair, you know, Flair loves to be a heel. And, I mean, I know when Flair was a babyface and he was drawing ratings, it was like, oh, you know, like, I just want to be turned heel, work with Hogan, you know, with, as a face. And, they, you know, they love that. They're comfortable with that. But it was, you know, wasn't the right thing at the time, I didn't think. Yeah, but don't you think Rick wants to go? You can't go back. It's all changed now. Rick wants to go back where you could draw with emotion. Todd Hill, boom, they love him. He's like the James Bond jet. Flying, limo <laughs> riding. That's what these guys at work tell me. They want to know about Flair, how cool he is. Oh, boy, he ran the limo, huh, Tom? Oh, these guys at work. You know, that's what people, they're so out of touch doing their little angles behind the scene or Internet people. Not that the Internet's bad, but that's not mainstream America. They're not tuned into the pulse. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, I know to what you're saying. To humiliate yeah. Flair like that in a mental place? No, come on. But Flair... Yeah. It, they want to cheer for him. Heels aren't the same. They want to cheer the heels for talking trash. It's totally different, don't you think, Dave? Other than John Absolutely. Eater. Sit down, fat boy. You know how... You know, Adam, let me, let me go real quick because we're running low on time. I want to get one more call in, okay? Let's let's go to Matt in Iowa. Matt, just really, you may got to make it real quick because we're running low on time. Hey, Tom. Hello. I just wanted to say that I've seen your work in Japan before, and it was really great. Thank you. Todd, when you wrestling guys like Kawada kicking your face hard enough to make you cry, well... <laughs> Have you ever considered no, going that was back? Combat and, pay. Have Pardon? you ever considered going back and maybe wrestling with the Saitama Pro Wrestling <laughs> Company or you something? You want to go back to back to all Japan now? No, oh, no. I'll be I'll, I'll be four, I'll be forty two. I burned a bridge back there. You know, I mean, I I didn't show up on a tour. I just I had enough. I was done. All I did to get booked back in Japan was to hide out. I didn't think they'd fly me back for the McMahon steroid trial. <laughs> when I was done with WCW, that was it. Close the book. I can't compete with those young kids. I, one thing I was is an athlete. Young and guys. I know my physical prime is done. After 36, if I'd have kept training or whatever, being big like that, but no. You know, I'm not going to kid myself and, you know, other people that think they're a freak in nature, whatever. But I say otherwise, you know. I don't make my living at it, so I, I have nothing to lose. I, I'll tell the truth. No. Couldn't compete like that at a work rate like those guys. Guys have, it's in, you know, there's no place in the United States you see action like that. All the high spots, boom, boom, fast. Stiff chops, you you know, that's wrestling. I like that style, and I'm a fan of it. I prefer it because you don't have to think. There's no manipulating. You get on the bus, you look good, you train, you help the young guys, you just get along there. You have to get along on the Japan bus, touring bus, and if you can earn a spot on the bus, that's kind of prestigious. And you work for the company. That's where I learned to do job. You, you know, it's part of their culture. Don't forget, uh, we'll be back here tomorrow at 6.